I'm coming to you today to ask for your help in bringing together an incredible project, the Community Mindfulness Center. This inclusive space is intended to promote the well-being of our community locally and abroad, as well as to help us discover a sense of well-being and basic goodness. We are trying to raise a million dollars for this state-of-the-art facility, which will provide both spiritual and secular programming. We really hope that you can come together to help us make this dream into a reality. Thank you for joining tonight's Basic Buddhist Teachings. Tonight, I am going to talk about a topic I've talked about quite a bit, but I want to talk about it in a little bit of a different way, perhaps, and that's the topic of generosity. Generosity is one of the six paramitas. It's the first paramita, or dana. And it's one of the oldest practices in Buddhism that in order to survive, early monastics at the time of the Buddha relied on the generosity of the laity to help feed them, just give them their bowl or if they needed a patched robe. It's also said that the request for offerings was a form of generosity. So the monks, the bhikkhunis, the, the bhikkhus expressed generosity by giving people an opportunity to offer. So they indiscriminately went from door to door asking for their uh, their new meal. But I wanted to talk about um, uh, an acknowledgement of generosity that Sokozan makes in his meditation primer. And this is the um, the meditation instruction I've talked about quite a bit. As I've listened to this a lot. And for some reason, um, it always makes me cry a little bit when I listen to it. And I, I was trying to find it on my phone to play the audio of it because there's something about the way Sokuzan presents it. But he gave this meditation instruction on a Wednesday night probably 11 years ago. And I was sitting in the Doan seat. It's a very vivid memory for me. And he's sitting here and um, before every meditation or before, yeah, before every meditation session on Sunday and Wednesday, so because I would give a meditation instruction. That's where these books came from. Um, most of these were given here at the monastery. I'm going to read the whole thing, but there's only one line I'm going to... Um, try to talk about tonight. So this is a second meditation instruction called Thank You Very Much. I have no complaint about anything whatsoever. As usual, we would finish our chanting. So we just finished the Heart Sutra. We would chant that at 7 p.m. And we would finish the service. And so I would say, please face the wall. Everyone turns and faces the wall. What we are doing here is controlling something that we seem to have control over, the body. We are doing something that people in general do, do not ever do other than perhaps when they're sleeping. This is called Shikantaza in the Zen tradition and it means just sitting, just completely being here, simply with nothing extra. So hold the body very, very still and endeavor to observe what arises in the six sense fields. Sense of touch, how this feels. Sense of taste, how this tastes. Sense of smell, how this smells. Sense of sound, anything that comes is welcome. Sense of seeing, just this simple space in front of you is completely generous by being there, completely giving you everything. Just observe. Look at this wall or out this window, depending on where you are or across the room and just observe. Please, just observe. Whatever comes, no matter how ragged, ragtag or crippled the thoughts are that come and go, please just observe. If you get really upset, just observe. Do not try to be peaceful. If you get really excited or happy, just observe. Do not add your stamp of approval. Please, it is not about getting over your emotions, your thoughts, your memories. It is not about getting rid of anything at all. This may surprise you. I'm afraid that the ears, nose, tongue, body, mind that you entered this particular existence with are yours. 
So what's being said here is just be genuine. Be completely, thoroughly, and totally in your seat and observe what arises. And with the attitude, with the complete understanding that may be put in this way, thank you very much. I have no complaint about anything whatsoever. Thank you very much. I have no complaint about anything whatsoever. Even your rising complaints have no complaint about. Whatever arises out of this space we call the mind is completely and totally perfect as it is, regardless of how heart-wrenching it can be. Please just observe, be genuine. In this way, sitting on this cushion, if only for a few moments or for several days, we have the opportunity to return to our original nature, our true nature, who we actually are. Holding the body very still without being rigid, all the senses are open, Whatever is arising at this very moment is exactly what you need to see. Don't accept it. Don't reject it. Don't look away. Just observe. Don't pull it into your lap. Don't throw it out the window. Don't change the subject. Whatever comes toward you, receive it. Whatever leaves you, say goodbye. As it is. And when I first heard this meditation instruction, um, there was something about the the last line, whatever whatever leaves you, whatever leaves you, say goodbye. And that's the part where I just kind of collapsed. But there was a part earlier on that has come to have great meaning for me as a teaching. When he says just this simple space in front of you, is completely generous by being there, completely giving you everything. It's just something to reflect on if we sit in front of a wall, which when we think of positive, negative, and neutral, it's a pretty neutral experience. It's something we take for granted. We really take for granted. Without the wall, I mean, the roof would be on our head or there'd be more bats in the building the snow would get in, be very awkward in the bathroom. And so this very simple situation, which he acknowledges, this very simple situation of the wall in front of you is being completely generous just by being there. It's giving you everything. The type of generosity I want to perhaps go into tonight is the generosity of things as they are without demand for alternatives. And so if the wall is expressing this perfected generosity of just fully embodying its nature of studs and plaster and holding up the roof, providing us something to look at, It's a good starting point to recognize that there's nothing that's not expressing this type of generosity. Because the generosity has nothing to do with its relative value. It's just in showing up. That's what he said. Mm-hmm. So Kazan says, just this simple space in front of you is completely generous by being there. By being there, it is its generosity. By being there, It is the generosity. He doesn't go into what I went into. It's holding up the roof. It's giving us something to look at just by being there. It's completely giving you everything. But to just consider, even for a moment, that everything is giving us everything in every given moment, whatever we are experiencing, whatever we are looking at is offering us a type of gener- generosity that we can't even comprehend because we can't evaluate it. We can't recognize it because of its value to us. It's just inherent value. This is similar to what Sokazan talked about. I have a memory of him talking about appreciation. 
how to appreciating something. There's no demand for it to be different. A fundamental appreciation or a fundamental love has nothing to do with transaction or reciprocity. It is a type of appreciation that recognizes even confusion as being completely generous by just being there, by giving us the opportunity to receive it as it is. And what I also found interesting is that what four times, please, 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 please just observe, please just observe. Please, it is not about getting over your emotions, your thoughts, your memories. It's not about getting rid of anything at all. And so there's the apparent external situation and its expressions of generosity, the wall, the people we relate to, the situations we engage in. But to begin to consider the generosity of our own neurotic minds, giving us an opportunity to see through this delusion of self and other. And this is where I have been returning to a great deal lately because it's hard for me to see the generosity of my mind because all I see is, is chaos and warfare, and struggle and tension and resolution and conflict. And all of that seems to be empowered by my desire to pacify it or get into a situation where it's manageable. And that there's no escalation of chaos, though, that is not the same generosity that the wall is presenting just by being there. And it's very hard to take those instructions from Sokuzan. Please just observe. It's not about getting over your thoughts. It's not about getting over your emotions, your feelings. You don't have to get rid of anything. Because it feels like we do. It feels like there's no way we can live a sane uplifted life while still having this chaos arising within consciousness and the apparent chaos arising outside of ourselves. But maybe we can start with the simple example of the wall. It doesn't have to be um, profound or complicated or complex or philosophical. It's just the wall offers itself to you. You offer yourself to the wall. You sit down, you acknowledge that. And while looking at the wall, everything becomes generous. Our minds become generous in a way we've not been able to recognize when we're moving around and engaging the mind. So we need the stillness of the practice to recognize or to begin to even consider the generosity of the mind. It's gener generous in its production, it's generous in its maintenance, it's generous in its dissolution. None particularly better than the other, but as long as it's there, as long as it's arising just by showing up, it is a type of generosity that goes far beyond what we can offer as far as content or material or actions or gestures or words. It's a type of generosity of things as they are. Not that I see that or not that we're seeing things as they are but it's just simple. It's not an elaborate philosophy. It's a willingness to intend to receive the world, to receive our minds as it shows up. And if anyone would like to email me, I would be very happy to send you a recording of Sokazan giving this instruction. I know I have it on my computer. I just could not find it on my phone this evening. So generosity, there's a generosity of offering, there's a generosity of receiving, and then there's a generosity of acknowledging things are exactly where they need to be, and to some extent, perhaps a great extent, they're none of our business. I like, I don't know if I've shared this Zen story, I don't remember which of the five houses, which of those masters told this story or the story was about, but a student came to the teacher and said, do you have a word or a phrase that would express the absolute? And he said, yes. And the student says, well, then what is it? And the teacher says, 
I know it, but it's none of my business. I don't know that I fully understand, but I just really appreciate Even if it's right in front of us, it doesn't mean it's our business to to materialize and to transact in as it is this, I guess. And there are any questions this evening? Nishikai. Nishikai. Does practicing generosity relatively help us see the generosity that's being offered that you're talking about? I think it, it may as long as it doesn't become like a habituated situation. I can think of there are times where I've been given explicit directions from Sokazan on, on generosity as a way to maybe acknowledge my stinginess or the most often times is like the habituated thought patterns around I should only give if I feel like giving or if I can validate the giving and that shows up with you know, with my relationship with um, Senshu early on, I didn't ever really feel like being very affectionate. It's not um, natural. And and to some extent, I think Sokazan pointed out the absurdity of that, or it felt like it where it doesn't, doesn't matter how you feel all the time. Like give, give that affection, give a hug, tell, tell your wife you love her, my girlfriend at the time. And so there's an example of practicing relative expressions of generosity to help me see what is that fixation about where I don't want to do that. But again, it has to be done situationally. We just finished up Denkaway where we talked about the 59 slogans of Atisha and there's a lot about uh, generosity and there's a lot about what to do and not do. And if it becomes too mechanical, it really doesn't, amount to much but maintaining relative expressions of generosity so it always has to or it seems like it needs the basis of awareness so as long as we're intending to use it to look more closely at the situation i think those expressions of generosity can be very meaningful what if we're someone who feels that generosity comes easy to us or we're like a people pleaser, that kind of a thing? Is there a way to look at, yeah, how would you recommend looking at our own generosity? Hmm. I remember um, one time talking to you and I don't remember the exact context, but it was like, if I, the more I tried to get you to do something, the more you were just not going to do it. So um, you don't need to, I wouldn't focus on the generosity part, but you could look at the areas that you feel stingy or you feel like justified in withholding, whether that's just your time. We're not just talking about material transaction. Everybody look at me. More interesting than Jada. So what did he say to you? That I can look at where I might be sting stingy, like with my time. That's all that's showing up. Is there anything else that you can be stingy with that you can see? What shows up for me is I'm kind of stingy about my mind or I like to keep my own mind private but you, know, you try to cover up your foolishness yeah mm -hmm. can you comment on that I would just say that it's as I've been hearing and we've all been hearing it's about the awareness of that when I say that though I also recognize that again situationally there are times to put tension on that that you set up a form of making an offering of your mind or your time or whatever it is so that you can attention actually helps you see what it is you're protecting or fixating on <clears throat> the phrase trunk or use of poverty mentality really resonates with me like to see where i feel 
like almost frantically poor. Like it's like, how could you even think of asking me for that? You 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 don't you really don't see how little I have. You really don't see how little time I have. You really don't see how little money I have. And you're going to ask me for that. And so it's it's the awareness of that. And with the help of a teacher, the situation, seeing if there aren't times where it might not be appropriate to put tension on that to see more closely because it's easy to settle into a pattern, particularly here. I think it can be easy to settle into a pattern of what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. And you've gotten permission. So while you have permission, so that's that. I don't really need to look at that anymore. And it takes a little bit of energy on our end to continue to investigate those areas. Go ahead, Nishikai. Nishikai Lauren, um, what do you mean when you say to put tension on an area? Well, I could give you an example. Um, you could, you know, with you know, with your, with Nicole, with your partner, say. Uh, I want to go over to the temple every single day this week at 8 a.m. She's working. Okay, so that doesn't work. But when she gets home, I'm going to go every day at 2.30 p.m. to at least sit the first half hour of five sets for the week. Um, that's difficult. We were going to schedule an interview for Denkoy, and you got home at noon or so. Is that... And but 1.30 was too early. No, no, it needs to, if it can be, can we please do later? And of course, that's not a problem for me, but that kind of protectiveness. And it's not like if you open up that area that it's an indefinite thing. Well, now you always have to be available at this time. But there, I don't know about you, but there can be a fear for me that if I give it up once, then I'm going to be expected to give it up every time. And so those kind of forms that can be pretty finite for one week. I'm I'm going to endeavor or intend to do this, or I am going to have Dokusan with Sokuzan every other week for the next two months. I'm going to tell them what's going on. I don't know if those are in the areas where you feel stingy, but that's the kind of situation I'm thinking of is setting up some sort of form around it. Shoto. Shoto bowing. Um thinking about that poverty mentality. There was a story in Dogen recently where he referenced a traditional story where a, a boy offers sand and, and the, the commentary was saying that it doesn't even have to be your thing to offer it. You can offer something you don't own and I don't really understand that. Have, have you heard that? And do you know what it, would, what it would mean to offer something that's not yours? You could offer your thoughts. Um, I think... There's something in the uh, Bodhisattva prayer we say about um, offerings, both seen and unseen. Is there some, does that ring any bells for you, the Bodhisattva prayer? Anybody know that line? Yeah. Mostly, both actually presented and mentally, mentally created. created. Yes, thank you. Both actually presented and mentally created. So those are those are offerings that you, you don't own those, but you can... You can make an offering of those. You could also say there's there really isn't anything that you own that you get to offer. It's not really yours to possess. Um, I don't know if that again if that's in the area that you're thinking of. Sure, bowing. Um, if we have an abundance of something where it doesn't hurt to give it away, is it still generous to offer that? It is. You can't. You can't. I don't see how you can hold to any standards around generosity. We have to work within the context of these causes and conditions, and we're not looking to become martyrs of generosity or to live up to an ideal form, but we look at how we can make offerings, and we do the best we can, and we return to it. And I, I would say that there's a very simple one that we almost stop making an offering of because it becomes so habitual, and that would be bowing as an offering or incense as an offering it becomes so we don't we don't actually consider this as giving something we just know the mechanics of this light the incense pull it out bow stick it in the 
offer it, offer it into the sand and then you walk away. But you, you could actually take a moment to consider like, I make this offering on behalf of all sentient beings to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. It may not have to be that formal, but the same thing with the bowing, that you are making an offering of your body. Shoto bowing. Um, recently, I, I, I got uh, corrected or pointed out on, I think, a public thread with us where I was explaining that I think I said you dump the water offering out in the garden and immediately Sokazan said you offer it. Yes. What what is that distinction or what is that? It's like the difference between offering something and throwing something away, that that is a form, that is a form. It's not like, well, it's off the altar now and and I've got to go get rid of it. That is that. It is a complete form. The, the entirety of that situation is is very important that you come in here and you bow to the Kagyu shrine and you take the water pitcher and you put each bowl into that water pitcher, pitcher and you wipe out every bowl and you flip it, put it back on. And you walk out with some formality. You're not just holding the jug. You, you in as much as you can do shashu with the jug, you walk out, you bow, and you return that water to the garden doesn't have to be like oh i offer this water to the birds and the bees and but it's not just you're not just getting rid of it so you can get back inside although that may happen and that's to be i guess included or be aware of being bowing if we are giving our attention, what is left? What is more to give? I don't know that there is anything necessarily to give. But you may find yourself giving spontaneously because you're giving something your attention, that you're actually looking at it. And so therefore the intimacy can show up without premeditation. So it's not just like, well, I'm giving it my attention. I don't have to do anything else. But you may find that if you are really giving something your attention, that the natural generosity of the situation can show up. So I, I think that, as I was saying to Nishikai, there may be times where we actually practice with expressions of generosity. But I think as you're bringing up, and as I understand Sokozan's teaching, it's always going to be about the awareness itself and the intention more than any sort of graspable fruition. Yeah, so I'm thinking about that example of uh, throwing water out or offering water out. If our attention is given to both situations, what, what kind of distinction are we looking at there what I would say just notice if you're what the what the thinking process is doing in either one of them I hear what you're saying and both explanations are a relative path expression there's both of them have to do with success and failure but what I hear you saying is I would just be very consider it about whatever thoughts you have around it. We'll just look very closely while well, I'm being aware, like that kind of justification, any justification around it, whether it's I'm now offering the water or I'm just being aware of it and then splashing it out. It can be very, I just think that there's an aspect of it that can be very simple. It can be very, it can be just a very simple, it does not have to be an elaborate, Production. Adriana Bowie. Just one more from the unit. Oops. You're okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Adriana. Bowing. Sorry for the interruption there. Um, sometimes it seems. Um, 
easiest to not be generous with the people that are most generous with us or who have been most generous with us. And I'm not sure why that is. Do you have any thoughts about it? That way? Well, I always get a little irritated that I always buy the meal when I'm with my little brother. Because he, he makes probably eighty to $100,000 a year and has no kids and he can afford a $30 breakfast. <laughs> and yet I make it a point to pay every time. So it's a silly thing. It's it's perhaps, but I've also been out to meals with our benefactors. Most recently, I went out for um, pizza and a beer with two of our benefactors, and I insisted on paying for that. Insisted because there was something about they don't need it; they can afford it. But there's something really important about gesturing or making that offering. So I think sometimes it's hard. When people have been so generous to them, to us, we find comfort in being the one that's taken care of. And it's not always as fun to be the one who's making that gesture in return. So Karen. <clears throat> so Karen Bowing, what is the most difficult offering to give to the teacher? Your mind. Um, unadulterated. That's how it's showing up for me right now to actually give an uh, unfiltered, unrefined offering of our confusion. I have been told I'm okay at giving, I'm pretty good at giving presents. Since she tells me that, and of course she wouldn't lie to me. And I like to, I like to find things. I've, I've, I, I really like finding presents for Sokazan. And I don't know what that is. It's the Garuda, it's the Mahakala. There's a few Tankas. Some you've seen, some you've not seen. It's, it's a poem. It's whatever. I just like, I like finding things. I think he'll like, I think that it's very helpful to me. And I think he enjoys them. I, you know, little Garudas. So, because I like knickknacks. I like stuff <laughs> a lot. More stuff is better. <laughs> and so, those are offerings that are pretty easy to make. It's easy for me to spend money on him as opposed to myself. Um, to be a good student, make an offering of my time. I've I've worked very hard and as far as I can over the last twelve years to make an offering of my life to Soka Koji. And in doing so to do a good job at that, I've had to keep some things at bay. And so now I'm making new offerings to Sokazan, which are of conflict, of combat, of prejudice, of anger, of resentment. And I won't even try to validate those by saying they're confusion or that they're clarity, but they're choiceless and they're painful. And that's a type of offering I had hoped to avoid but we can't just do that. We can't just artificially show our fierceness to the teacher or show our abrasiveness to the teacher because if it's premeditated, there's some sort of desire to get something out or prove something, show something to the teacher. So it's a type of vulnerability too because you have no say so and now you just now you're just crazy. You're just foolish. I come back to that. Years ago, so because I'm saying after a Saturday monk training day, back when I think there was just four of us, it was like Unyo, myself, Shoka, and, and Kozan giving talks. And, you know, what's the difference between the two of us? And he says, I know I'm a fool and you're still trying not to be one. How lucky was I to be able to enjoy not being a fool for a while? I would just say making an offering of, of one's mind which can be done in every form. You're always making an offering of your mind to the teacher. It's just harder when you don't get to have a say-so in those offerings. Go ahead, Sokran. Sokran Bowing, is that considered a confession? Well, I don't know. I I have so much baggage around that with my Catholic upbringing of, of confession, so it's a hard word. I I'd much rather consider it an offering 
because the, the confession has this sort of shameful mentality for me. I'm not saying that's what it is, or that's what Shanti Deva was talking about in his book, The Way of the Bodhisattva. But um, in as far as I have any say, so I, I try to consider it as, as an offering to my teacher. So Karen in a community that is small and perhaps fear arises that you might offer something of your mind that may arise publicly. <clears throat> Do you still offer that to the teacher bowing? I, I think again, it's it, to some extent you don't really have a say so. And I, I think it's very personal for each one of us. I don't relate to it as a point by point confession. I don't feel like I need to say every single point of what is going on content wise. And yet I can express the totality of what feels like showing up in one expression or one gesture. So situationally, I would not discourage you from doing that. And I'm not going to set up the standard that that's how people need to relate to it. But you will perhaps begin to see how little say so you have over what you offer. Could you say anything about threefold purity and how that relates to generosity and offering? I think when you're talking about threefold purity is that the no giver, no gift, no receiver. It's a fruitional quality well, it's relative. It's, a, it's an expression. It's a way of considering that this is not giving. There is nothing receiving and there's no content being transacted. And I don't know that I can say much about that, but I think about um, just giving. So when you have perception only, there's no nothing perceived and no perceiver, but there's the complete generosity of the perception itself. And so for me, it's not about so because I'm receiving my offering. It's not about me offloading my offering. It's it's the offering itself. Shoro. Shoro bowing. May I bring up a personal example about you that I overheard once? <laughs> <laughs> You brought up um, like the situation with your brother and then going out with the benefactors. And I remember being at the Black Stag after you got back, taking Shannon up to Canada. Mm -hmm. And there was something that happened there. And so Gazan said, what, what is that? And you said it was pride. Okay. Um, is there still that kind of pride showing up with your brother? And when you're taking out the, the benefactors in those, of course, does generosity have to be without pride? I don't think that it, it has to be without anything. I think that's why it's the wall is being completely generous and it's not absent of anything, but it's not getting its value because of what it's being described by or how it's being related to it is. It is a type of generosity that goes beyond function and it's not impeded by function. So our presence is a complete offering of generosity. Our pride is an offering of generosity. Our anger, our passion, aggression is offerings of generosity, but that doesn't mean we get to validate the outflow. It doesn't mean we get to validate and say, well, it's it's generous, so I'm going to be angry. It's generous, so I'm going to be prideful. It's generous, so I'm going to be... That's not the generosity at all. That's validating the content. And I don't understand Sokazan to be saying that at all when he's acknowledging just the simple space in front of you is completely generous by being there, completely giving you everything. Go ahead, Jishin. Jishin Bowing. I cannot uh, point out what, what makes me confused um, in the way you are expressing generosity as like the out, outburst of anger as generosity towards the teacher or towards someone else. Um, can we, 
I, and it, I, it just feels to me like a stretch and something which you mentioned that I can justify everything as my generosity, any kind of negativity being expressed. Um, can you help me to uh, understand better what would be that a difference between the true generous outburst of anger and, uh, and just uh, uncontrollable anger, which is a pure expression of... Uh, of negativity, no, bowing. I don't think that any either one would be less generous than the other. We're not talking about a generosity of validation. It's not you getting to be generous because of your anger or you showing your generosity through your anger. It's the anger ex itself that's the generosity. And it's it's only generous because it's it's showing up. It's, it's dependent origination. It's not something that we in our little... Um, say so our one in one million causes and conditions get to take credit for but i think it's just the very fact that it's showing up is the generosity it is the expression that we could look at to see that there is as chokodawa was pointing out or, or bringing up that there's no one expressing that anger and there's no one receiving that anger and yet there's this incredible display that may arise. Jishin Baling, so in this, in, in, in this under, with this understanding, any kind of cruelty can be called in the world, can be, can, and, the, and negativity can be called the generosity, generosity of, of cruelty expressing itself. Uh, is, is this what you are suggesting? Sounds, I'm sure it sounds distasteful, but yes. Yes, it, it, it's like, uh, just because you have an attitude, just because you have a mindset or a paradigm or a philosophy that invalidates those expressions does not mean those expressions cease. And so therefore, because they're showing up in the world, they're to be received. So I'm not saying we go along with that kind of hatred and anger and destruction, but our mindsets, no matter how polished and, and pleasant and comfortable, they don't change that this is still arising as dependent origination and in that sense in as far as we can we we endeavor to receive it or we include the generosity of our resistance to it so we receive our resistance our negativity i think what we could also consider is we don't have to understand this we're not talking about just implementing a philosophy around this it's just giving us a chance to look more closely at the discrimination that occurs in the mind. And as Sokuzan said to me recently, if there's no tension, there's no awareness. Very particular to that situation perhaps, but if we don't have some sort of tension, we can't really look at it very well. So the tension brings our attention right down into it. So please don't go around saying, well, everything is generosity and this bombing is generosity and this storm is generosity and this uh, violence is generosity, but don't look away from it just because it doesn't fit into your ideas about how the world should function. Don't reject it immediately based on an idea, but look at the abrasiveness of its um, arising. Thank you. Had Adriana. Adriana bowing. How can I receive the generosity of my resistance to genocide. Belly. Don't take your eyes off either one. Don't don't validate death or hatred or killing, but don't reject your resistance either. We're not trying to make you okay with what is happening. We're not trying to neutralize our feelings and preferences. We're trying to include in such a way that we're looking at as much as possible before we do anything and that we may have to do something, but we don't take our eyes off of it just because we've started to function. So I I know for me, it's been hard over the years because Sokazan has been pointing at this for a long time and it's very hard when we have a tenderness and, and we're so close to suffering of others 
it's very hard in the midst of that to see or to acknowledge how much we're ignoring as well, which actually impedes our ability to help. So Kazan talked about this during book study today. So just endeavor to include and don't set up too much of a standard on how you need to function. Shoto and then we'll close. Shoto bowing. Um, if it's not about getting rid of our pride or any of those things, why does the teacher continue to point those out and even scold us about those things? Because he's really mean. <laughs> Very valid question, because it's not enough to see the idea of pride, that even if we tell ourselves we see it and we're working with it, we're still trying to credentialize our negativity. I would also say that there are no expressions which we should be, that we need to reject. And I've said this recently, it's being able to receive the teacher without validating, even, even that little mantra, everything's a teaching can be very helpful and we may need to hear it, but it, it may show up that we need to just receive it as the intense abrasiveness it shows up in. And that's when things for me get much more difficult. It's actually easier to receive when you're constantly telling yourself everything's a teaching Everything's you're teaching, everything's for your benefit, Acharya. That's a line I've, I still work with all the time. So it takes us below a level of maintenance. It takes us below what we're able to grasp and, and validate and justify into a pretty raw and tender area, which is I'm doing my best. <laughs> and that's just another area to look at, I think. Thank you. We'll stand and dedicate the merit. I'm coming to you today to ask for your help in bringing together an incredible project, the Community Mindfulness Center. This inclusive space is intended to promote the well-being of our community locally and abroad, as well as to help us discover a sense of well-being and basic goodness. We are trying to raise a million dollars for this state-of-the-art facility, which will provide both spiritual and secular programming. We really hope that you can come together to help us make this dream into a reality.